Well, um, thank you everybody for joining me. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to give this talk about um, both about my research and more broadly about the role of um, theoretical statistics in analyzing data um, from a very rigorous mathematical perspective. Because I know many of you um, have an interest in mathematics and perhaps you you think that you're more interested in theoretical math at this point, but um, here's one possible direction that um, you might go into in the future that sort of combines the um, rigorous theoretical mathematics that you like and will learn about in the coming years um, with a possible chance to interf interface with some real world applications. Um, I am a faculty in the statistical laboratory in the DIPIMS department at Cambridge. So I'll begin um, with one slide that sort of summarizes some of my recent areas of, um, of, of research interest. Um, uh, these include high dimensional statistics, which is a term that you probably aren't familiar with, but we're going to tease apart in the first part of this talk. Um, machine learning, which is um, getting quite popular these days using um, computers and artificial, artificial intelligence to perform useful day-to-day -day tasks. Um, robust design, when you might have data that um, don't exactly come from ideal clean environments. Um, private estimation, when you might want to do some sort of estimation or inference task with certain constraints. For instance, you want to respect the privacy of individual data, individual users. Um, network modeling, and you'll see also in this talk um, some examples of network type data and the types of interesting questions you might ask. And then optimization, which is sort of a, a tool that is often used in my research to solve various problems that um, you see listed above. And I would say that the overall theme, both today and in my general research area, is to design new mathematical tools to study problems motivated by diverse structured data. Now, statistics is a topic that has been around for quite some time. Um, and I think what I want to drive home is that there are lots of interesting um, new types of data that we see in, um, in the modern world um, for which it might be necessary to come up with um, new methods for performing estimation and inference, which then lead to rather interesting um, uh, studies, both theoretically and empirically um, in, in, the, in the world of statistics. Okay, so I've highlighted here um, three of the topics that I'm going to try to give you a snapshot of today, um, high dimensional data, robustness, and network modeling. And I think this gives a nice um, overview of, of some of the interesting problems that we face. So let's begin by sort of discussing these ideas of robustness and high dimensions. Um, just to give you an idea, the term high dimensional statistics is something that has become popular in the last um, 15 or so years. Um, and you, you hear these days about big data and big data can, can mean many things to different people. Um, oftentimes it just means that you have very large data sets. But specifically in statistics, um, big data often refers to um, what's also called high dimensional data. And that's where the number of parameters or um, types of measurements you want to take for each observation is much larger than the number of observations. Um, and just as, as a couple examples, um, we, we can see some here. So um, if, if you've taken statistics um, in, in your high school classes, then you might be used to settings where you just want to measure one or two values. Maybe it's like the height and weight of a person and you have many observations. Maybe you have a class of 50 people. Um, in that case, the number of parameters is somewhat smaller than the number of observations. Um, but in modern day problems, um, some include, for instance, genetic analysis. Maybe you have um, lots and lots of genes, and you don't have too many people from which you can um, take data samples. Other health studies might include um, that you're, you're just taking continuous measurements of um, someone monitoring them over a period of days or weeks. And again, you don't have that many patients, just simply because, because you're allowed to monitor lots and lots of different things all at once because of modern technology. Um, and another example that we'll go into in, in quite a bit of detail is medical imaging, um, and we'll get to that. Basically, you're taking very large images, so the dimensionality corresponds to the number of pixels in the image. And again, you, you don't have too many patients for which you can um, collect this very detailed data. And other examples include face recognition, which is also an image processing, spam filtering, astronomy, climatology, and so on. For instance, for astronomy, there are often these um, surveys of the whole night sky, where you take measurements from lots of different angles of the whole sky um, and you you take a, you take the measurements over a period of several days but then the number of days might be large but it's not nearly as large as the number of directions in which you are taking these measurements okay and and maybe just to quantify things um, for some of these for many of these applications maybe think about 
um, either number of parameters, number of genes you're measuring, or the number of pixels in your image to be on the order of tens of thousands, whereas the number of patients, say, the number of observations is something like 100. So P is much larger than N. So just to reiterate, this is very different from what's known as classical statistics, in which um, the number of measurements per individual P is, is, is much, much smaller than N. Um, and so the idea is that, um, well, kind of, if you, if you think about this, maybe philosophically, it seems very hard to make accurate predictions when the number of observations you have is so small compared to the number of things you're measuring. Um, and so what, what is often done in many of these applications is that um, the idea is that there's some underlying low dimensional structure. So really, you know, even if you're taking measurements of 10,000 genes, there might only be three or four or maybe 10 genes that are really that important in determining whether someone will have a disease. Um, and so for that reason, you, it, it's possible to design different types of estimation procedures that work well, even with a relatively small size of N, because the effective dimension of your data set, what really matters is, is a lot smaller than P and is in fact something much smaller than N. So what we want to do as statisticians is to come up with methods that will find this hidden low dimensional structure um, without knowing a priori what it is. Because of course, if you knew which genes were causing your disease, then you would just measure those. And the point is that you're doing these large scale health studies where you don't really know ahead of time and you want to have the data tell you um, and uncover what the underlying structure is, as well as the predictive model for, for figuring out if someone has a disease. Okay, so the example that we're going to focus on um, is not genetic data, but it's medical imaging data, um, which is still an example of this high dimensional statistics. Um, specifically, we're going to look at um, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, um, perhaps because this is one of the, one of the first places in which um, high dimensional statistics theory really met with practice and had, it, had an impact. So um, what you see here is an MRI, MRI scanner. Perhaps um, many of you have been in these if you've um, broken a bone or, or, or hurt something internally and the doctor wants to check you out. Um, here are some images that are, are sometimes created from the scans. So a head angiogram, angio means blood vessel. So this shows the, the blood vessels in the brain um, or in the head. Here's a, a slice of a brain. Here's another slice of a brain in, in the other orientation. Um, and, and the goal is that, well, so, so you, you go inside the scanner and then the, um, the technician takes many measurements and then um, the, these measurements are processed through some sort of algorithm, um, which we're going to go into in a moment. Um, and what comes out is an image. But what we want is that we want to be able to ideally have someone sit in the scanner for as short a time period as possible because it's expensive to image people for long periods of time. So here's where this, um, this interplay between P, the number of things you're measuring, and N, the number of measurements you take, becomes very important because it makes a big difference whether you take 10,000 measurements versus if you take 100 measurements. And if you think about it for um, a pediatric patient, it makes a huge difference because um, little children can't sit still for that long. Okay, so here's one slide that says a little bit about the physics of um, MRI and how it translates into mathematics. Um, I'm going to go over it, it fairly quickly. Um, but the, the basic take home idea is that um, the measurements that you take are going to be a linear combination of certain values um, of the physical object, let's say the brain, which you want to then reconstruct. Okay, so here's, a, um, here's an integral e equation. And it says that the ith signal that you take is an integral of m of x, y. So m of x, y, um, you can think about these as the values at individual pixels in the image, right? So imagine that you're trying to perhaps take, um, reconstruct the image, um, a slice of a brain, then m of x, y is going to be um, the, the vector, the value at um, the magnitude um, at, at, at position um, x comma y. And what do I mean by magnitude? Well, actually, it turns out that what's showing up in these pictures um, is, is uh, the concentration of water molecules at different places. All right, so when we see white, we see that there's a certain concentration. When we see dark, that means that there's basically zero concentration of water, and that's what's showing up in the scan. So M is the, is the magnitude, is the total number, or perhaps the density of water molecules at a particular position. Um, and the signal that you get is going to be an integral um, of, of these um, values over the whole um, range of, of the picture um, with a particular weight. And, and the weights depend on, um, on certain frequencies that, at which you acquire, um, acquire images so, um, or uh, acquire signals. So without going into too much detail, um, maybe a little bit more of the physics is that 
what happens is that there's a there's an underlying magnetic field inside the MRI machine um, that aligns all of the water molecules in the um, in, in the object to be spinning in in one direction, um, and then there's a pulse that um, that sort of uh, um, that that knocks these out of out of their their nice spin, and then um, what what is measured is the amount of precession. Um, so based on the density at, at different places, you get um, certain um, different linear combinations of, of the density of the molecules at various positions in, in your object. Um, so what you, what you can do is you can choose the signal, um, uh, choose the frequency at which you want to acquire. So this corresponds to the pair kx, ky. Um, and then you take a particular weighted integral, and then that gives you a signal. And then you do this again and again, and you 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 um, you you acquire these signals at very at different frequencies, and then based on all of these, you try to reconstruct um, this entire um, array um, m x y, which corresponds to your image, all right? So um, in in a little bit more technical terms, and and I guess you would see this in a more of an engineering or a physics class, um, when you see after you see this overall um, vector s of all of the signals, and you know what the kx ky pairs are for the corresponding signals, what you do is apply something called a a two um, D discrete Fourier transform um, to to reconstruct. Oh, and then there's some noise because as statisticians, we always like to model noise into the world, right? Because every measurement should be taken with some error. And you'll see this formula again, but in a more compact way in a moment. Okay. Um, so here's another kind of uh, um, uh, heuristic-y um, explanation. So um, what you want to do is you want to, to invert in, in some sense. Well, you, you want to, to look at these signals that you've measured. You have measured some large number N of the signals. And you want to reconstruct um, the image, which so we said that it was an image. That's it's it's a um, it's two dimensional thing, but we can think about it as um, vectorizing the image so that the the dimensionality um, of the overall vector is whatever the um, the vertical times the horizontal dimensionality of your image. Um, so we will call that p, right? Um, so it, it seems to make sense that you know if you want to do this reconstruction, then probably you don't want p to be too large because you're only taking n measurements. So we say that we want the dimension of the signals s to be um, to be some, something bigger than the dimensionality of of the of the image. Um, however, as I said, we want to 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 make the number of observations as small as possible. So you don't if you if you're taking a big or a very high resolution image, you don't want the person to have to sit in the in the scanner for too long because each one of every time you acquire a signal. Um, it, it takes some time to reset the machine, and then to you know you have to you have to make all of the um, all of the the molecules, the water molecules in in the um, in the object realign, turn on the magnetic field, and, and take the measurements and so on. Okay, so you don't want to take n um, on the order of p the number of pixels in the image. So now here's a very important um, phenomenon that happens in the real world. Which is that for a lot of images, um, not just um, images of, of people's anatomy, but images in general, it turns out that if you if you find the right representation of the image, you can actually represent it with um, much fewer than p um, different basis vectors. Um, so here's taking something out of linear algebra, right? So you know you you can you can represent an image in terms of um, of the, the the intensity of each pixel separately. So that's the the ordinary basis. You know, you say how how much um, intensity do I have in the first pixel, in the second pixel, in the third pixel, and so on up to p. Um, or you can always represent things in some other um, in some other basis. Here it's called a wavelet basis, in such a way that actually um, not all of the um, basis vectors are that relevant. So maybe as a as a simple example, if we go back to this um, angiogram. So if you look at this picture, then just as a picture itself, you know, it's a it's a large picture, but there aren't many. Um, there aren't many um, pixels that are not black because it's it's after all a blood vessels, right? And you don't know which pixels a priori are the ones that are not black. Um, if you did know that, you would just measure those, and then the dimensionality of your problem would be much less. So here's an example of a case where you know you know that underlying there is some low dimensional structure that you would like to leverage, but you don't know where it is, um, and you want some method that will kind of automatically find that for you and leverage that. Now, if you look at these pictures of the brain, maybe if you kind of try to fool yourself, you would say, well, there's also a lot of black in the image. Well, not really, not compared to an angiogram, right? It turns out that if you represent it according to the right so-called basis, um, this wavelet basis, and then you you then, so, so representing something as a basis means that you look at a linear combination of certain vectors, um, and or in this case, certain images. 
Um, and it turns out that if you then look at the coefficients that the 15% of the highest magnitude coefficients and just sum up that part of your, of your expansion, then what you see is um, to the naked eye, it's, it's almost the same as the original. Of course, it won't be exactly the same because most of your coefficients are not zero, but they're just really small if you choose the right basis. Okay, and here's the difference between them as an image difference. And you see that it's, it looks almost like white noise. So the idea is that underlying all of this is really some dimensionality k that's much, much smaller than p. And it turns out that uh, that in um, the number, if, if you've run the right type of reconstruction algorithm, um, then the number of observations you need can, can scale like the logarithm of the um, number of pixels in the image, which is of course much, much smaller than the number of pixels. And what really matters is effective dimensionality, which is like 15% of, of p. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more of the, the technical details. Like what I've given you right now is um, maybe the more physics and medical um, overview. Um, but since you know I'm a statistician and what I really care about is the math here. So if we go back to our integral equation, um, you can represent this as some sort of a linear system. So here S is an n-dimensional vector that tells, tells us what are all of the signals that we've measured for all the n observations. Then m is a vector which vectorizes um, the image. So you had, we had m of x, y. Now we sort of unwrap it and we and we put um, all of the um, we put m of the first coordinate one 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 two one three and so on up to the, the dimensionality of the picture. Um, and then we saw an integral. The integral is essentially taking linear combinations. Um, here this is f u. This is the um, undersampled um, Fourier transform matrix. So that just represents all the linear combinations that we're putting together. Um, and then epsilon is an n-dimensional vector that tells us what are all the noises that were incurred on each one of the, um, of the acquisitions. Okay, so our goal is that what we're given is S and F sub U, all right? So F sub U encodes what are the frequencies at which we measured, S encodes what are the signals that we acquired, and what we want to do is reconstruct M, okay? So um, in, as you would know from maybe a high school math, mathematics class, um, if you want to um, sort of uh, reconstruct or do some sort of linear regression, um, then what you should do probably is least squares regression, right? So you, you have these pairs, which correspond to the, um, to the, to the rows of, of, of the matrix F, as well as the corresponding signal S, um, and you would draw a best fit line. And the way you usually do a best fit line is you minimize the sums of the squares of the residuals um, to, the, to the corresponding points in the line. Okay, so but we want to do something a little bit different. So um, there's this matrix notation that we like to use as, as statisticians, where the first term essentially corresponds to um, the sum of the squares of all of these differences. And if we were just doing a, a least squares best fit line, then we would want our, our reconstructed image m hat to be the minimum of the sum of the squares, which is the first term. But now we, we also want to leverage the fact that these images um, are sparse in some, in some basis, right? So what I said about how um, there's an underlying structure and we just need to discover that. All right, so there's another term that we also include, and this is what we call a penalty. And essentially, the, what we want to minimize instead is, is not just the sum of the squared residuals, but this weight plus a weighted term that's a function of, um, of how sparse the image is. So going back to the um, brain angiogram, we would want something that tends to have lots and lots of um, black pixels um, and only a few white pixels, right? So you can kind of ignore what the psi is. The psi is the wavelet transform. If it weren't there, what we would be looking at is, is an L1 norm of M, and I'll explain a bit more about this in a moment. Okay, and um, and I should say that um, in theoretical statistics, um, just abstractly, there was a method called lasso that was invented in 1996, and then um, this became applied in the medical imaging context in 2007. Um, so as I said, this is one of the places where high dimensional statistics um, was first applied in um, in, uh, um, in 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 a medical imaging um, setting um, very successfully. Okay, so let's say a little bit more about what this penalty is. Well, um, so it, uh, well, there are various norms that you'll encounter in linear algebra. Um, and the L1 norm is the sum of the absolute values of all the components of the vector. Um, and if you, if you plot the absolute value, it looks like the figure on the left. Um, and, and you should think about, well, what exactly, why, why does it make sense to use this as a penalty? So really um, the, 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 the the philosophy behind this is that what we would like to do is we would like to trade off um, the number of non-zeros in, in, in the image with how good a fit we get when we use that particular image. 
So really what we want to do is we want to count the number of non-zeros in the vector or in, in, the, um, in the image M, right? The number of pixels in M. Um, and if you, if you count the number of non-zeros, then what you do is you take all the components of X and if it's a zero, it counts as zero. And if it's not zero, it counts as one. So what we should really be doing is we should be summing up this function that you see on the right. Okay, and what we wanna do is we want to minimize um, the sum of the squares and then um, together with a weighted sum of, of the, second, um, the second function. Um, but the issue is that, well, so there's this notion of convexity, which you will encounter if you haven't already in an optimization class. And it turns out that the, the function on the left is convex, but the function on the right is not. And a convex function, you can think of it as a bowl-shaped function. Um, I mean, neither of these functions are smooth, so they're not really bowl-shaped, but I mean, the one on the left is more bowl-shaped than the one on the right. So another property of convex functions is that if you connect any two points on the function, you should always lie um, above the function. But here you see that if you connect the origin with a point that's, um, that's not uh, the origin, then you'll sometimes lie below the function itself. And, um, and what you need to do is you need to actually solve this problem. You need to minimize this function. And it turns out that if you have a convex function, then it's easier to minimize than a non-convex function. And roughly speaking, well, convex functions are bowl shaped. So there is this optimization procedure known as gradient descent, which will keep descending. So you start from some point, you wanna to get to the minimum of your function and you keep descending until you get to a point where the gradient, uh, where the tangent um, has, has slope zero. And if it's a convex function, this will correspond to the minimum of the function. If it's not convex, it might not correspond to the minimum because you might get stuck in what's called a local minimum um, that's not quite the actual minimum. Okay, so the reason, um, so basically in 1996, um, this sort of objective was studied, um, the sort of minimization problem was studied abstractly um, as, a, as a version of the sort of um, penalized regression where, we, where, where people replaced the L0 um, count by the L1 norm to make things convex and then prove theory about it. Okay, and, and just to recap, um, this was then ported into the MRI setting um, in around 2007 um, to, to solve some real world problems. Okay, um, so, well, I mean, this is from 2007, now it's, um, you know, 2022. So, so what are some of the interesting questions? Well, it turns out that, you know, I mean, maybe these pictures sort of um, seem reasonable instead of this kind of a, a function, I'm looking at this convex function. Um, but then by nature, these two functions are also kind of different because Whereas the L0 function, um, it, will, it will count as one no matter how large your component is, right? It's just counting the number of non-zeros in, um, in your vector. The L1 norm, um, it grows like an absolute value. So if you have very big values, then they um, count as something very big. Whereas you might only want to say, if I have a non-zero value, it counts as, as something non-zero. So because of this, um, people have looked at other functions which sort of interpolate between this L0 shape and this L1 shape. And here are some examples, but then these functions turn out to be non-convex, um, but they're a bit closer to the, to the nicer L1 um, function. Okay, so in my own research, I've, I've analyzed um, both theoretically and empirically what happens when you use um, different types of functions like this. And um, things are more complicated because as I said, if the function is not convex, um, then you need to be much more careful about the type of optimization algorithm you use and the way that you, or what, what sorts of rigorous guarantees you can say, how many times do I need to iterate gradient descent in order to find a, a near global optimum? And do I know that I will find a, near, find a, a global optimum? Um, so some of the research questions are to derive statistical theory to quantify um, the reconstruction error that you get when you use these procedures as a function of the parameters. So the number of parameters, um, the number of um, the, the number, the dimensionality of the problem, the number of observations, and the amount of underlying stru uh, uh, and the, in the, in the, in the underlying dimensionality. Um, so here it's like fifteen percent of p, um, and also to develop some fast optimization algorithms um, with with rigorous convergence guarantees. Um, okay, um, and and I, I also promised that in addition to talking about um, about high dimensionality, I would also talk about robustness. So um, this also kind of crosses into um, optimization theory. So now we're still looking at the same type of problem. So let's imagine that we're doing image reconstruction in MRI and, and the optimization function that, I'm, um, that I've written here is what you've seen on, on previous slides. Um, but, but the other thing that I've worked on in my research is to try to um, change the first function. 
So we talked about how a best fit line is usually the least squares line. So you, you take a, if this is your data, these dots are your data, then you, um, if, if you're doing standard statistical techniques, you would try to draw a line so that the sum of the squares of the distances of the data points to the line is as small as possible. Okay, but now imagine a case when you have some outliers in your data. So in fact, in this image, um, in, in this picture on the right, we're pretending that we have some outliers. Most of the data tend to lie on a line, but maybe some, some of the points don't, all right? Then arguably, you might not actually want this black line. You might want the red line or the blue line because um, these correspond to um, sort of ignoring the outliers and fitting, um, fitting the, the, the points that are more on the line. So in fact, um, in, in classical statistics, the, the, the question of robustness was studied um, sometime around the 1960s. And there were some statisticians who came up with other types of, of, um, of functions that maybe you should be minimizing um, the sum of on the residuals of, of a, a linear regression in order to get a better fit when you have outliers in your data. And here are some of the shapes that we see. So least squares corresponds to some of the squared errors as we see a, para a parabola. And there's the absolute value function, that's the green line. And then there are some other functions like a Huber function or a Tukey function. And if you just, without going into the details of this, um, for this particular data set, if we use the red function as our a function that we are applying to the residuals, you get a line that's more towards the bulk of the linear data. If you use the blue curve, then it, it seems almost to be an even better fit. All right, but here we again run into a problem of non-convexity because um, whereas the, the black a parabola is a nice bowl-shaped convex function. If you want to use something that, um, that is a bit more aggressive and, and ignores outliers in your data, then you might have to look at something like this blue function, which is no longer bowl-shaped. It's sort of locally bowl-shaped around zero, but then it, it's not convex anymore. Okay, so kind of at a, a, at a mathematical abstract level, um, in my research, I have asked similar types of questions. Um, by similar types of questions, I mean uh, to these research topics that I mentioned before, um, when the loss function is um, is replaced by a non-convex function. Um, so going back to MRI, maybe to, to try to make things a little bit more concrete. So in, in st statistics, the nice thing is you can kind of go between the pure math, the like complete abstraction of your problem as uh, matrices and vectors and so on. Um, and then you can try to bring back the original motivating problem um, which involves real data, for instance, for medical imaging MRI data, and then apply it to the data set and see what happens. Um, so, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not too unreasonable to think that you might have settings in which you have outliers in your data. Maybe you're imaging a pediatric patient and your child starts to move. You know, you could even just be imaging a diaphragm and the child is breathing or wiggling or something. And if you just run a, a usual reconstruction method, um, then you end up with a blurry image. And that's what we see here. But then you can see what happens um, when you run a more robust procedure like the ones that I've described with different loss functions, and then it really cleans up the image reconstruction. Um, and so, you know, a very concrete problem then is to say, well, um, how do I derive the proper guarantees? You know, how do I know how much data I need to acquire, right? Because ideally you want to say, if I am imaging this type of image and I have this sort of movement or non-ideality, then, um, then approximately how many images do I need to acquire? Um, how, how many signals do I need to acquire? Is it like 100? Is it like 200? Is it like 1,000? And this is what, um, what the theory that is derived in, um, in the type of work that I do can in fact be, be used in practice. OK, so, um, so that was kind of the, the main um, problem that I wanted to talk about, which sort of brings up some modern data types, um, some, some modern engineering applications um, where we're collecting large amounts of data. You know, we have the ability to collect lots and lots of MRI data, but then we want to leverage some low dimensionality to not take too many measurements. Now I'm going to, to sort of switch gears to something completely different um, to tell you about a different type of, of data set that, um, that we also encounter these days often in, in many applications and some of the statistical problems. And this will be talked about in, in much more brevity than the first part, because there's, I just want to give you an idea of the many, many problems that are out there. So we're going to talk about network inference. Um, and the first problem we'll discuss in network inference is reconstruction of edges. So the idea is that you have, um, you have something um, that's abstractly going to be represented as a graph. So what do I mean by something? Well, imagine that you have genes. Um, maybe it's a person's genes. Here it's um, the genes of the E. coli organism. I chose E. coli because it doesn't have that many genes, whereas um, people have a lot. So, so what you have is, is genes, and you want to have some visualization of how these genes interact with each other. 
Okay, so this is kind of a visualization tool, um, but it's more than that, you know, after you visualize how, how interconnected things are, then maybe you can cluster them according to their connectivity. But the question is, well, I mean, what does, how do you infer connectivity, right? I mean, when you're doing genetic sequencing, you just take measurements of different genes. So what you see here is, is an mRNA array. Um, so they're different um, E. coli organisms and the, the brightness shows the intensity or the, the magnitude of each of the measurements for each of the genes. Um, and there are statistical procedures for getting from this data matrix to this network here. Um, so, well, um, so that, that, that's, that's one question. How, how would one do this? What does this even mean mathematically, right? Um, and another problem that, you know, if, if we're talking about networks, because as mathematicians, we can be as abstract as we want, right? A network can represent lots of things. It can be a gene network or something else. So what's, what's another something else one might care about? Well, um, people also care about brain mapping. So um, in brain mapping, what you do is, is you, you want to understand, well, how exactly are neurons connected to each other? And I mean, this needs to be taken with a grain of salt because you could ask actually physically how are neurons connected to each other? And that would probably involve doing some surgery and, and you know, looking at the way neurons are connected. Or you could ask how are neurons functionally connected to each other? You know, what's the visualization again of which neurons are, are operating together as a person thinks or goes about a certain action? So there you again have your data in the form of some sort of matrix, but um, the matrix might correspond to you know, putting electrodes um, on a person's head and, um, and measuring brain signals over time, right? So, so you can think about kind of discretizing this and getting a matrix. So um, every time you measure a, a different signal, you get, um, you get some line on the graph and the electrodes will tell you um, exactly you know, what's going on at each position in the brain. And based on that, you wanna go from your data matrix to um, to, to some network. Okay, so without going into detail, um, this is a problem that has drawn a lot of attention in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so the idea is to, to go from a data matrix, whether it's from brain recordings um, or mRNA, mRNA readings um, to a graph. And, um, and what one wants to do is, you know, there might be different types of methods that are more applicable to different types of data. Um, and then deeper than this, so um, maybe after you get your graph, after you come up with a method for, for reconstructing a graph, you might want to um, figure out ways to detect spontaneous changes. So for instance, um, in the brain case, you know, maybe, maybe you want to know just by looking at these signals, like do some mind reading. When does the person go from thinking about a certain task to thinking about another task? Or when can you detect that a stroke has happened or something like this? Um, and mathematically, um, for each of these um, inference procedures that you do to solve any of these problems, you want to also quantify how much data do I need relative to the number of electrodes or the number of genes in the data set. Okay, um, now on to something different. So here's another problem with um, a modern day data set and a statistical question. So, um, I mean, interestingly enough, I, I, I worked on this in the years before COVID hit, but now everyone cares a lot about contact tracing and, and so on. Um, so the question here is, you know, again, we have network data. Um, and what you have is some sort of a social network and people interact with other people. And based on, on seeing um, who in the network has been infected, you want to try to understand how can I infer who the initial um, patient zero was, All right? So, so here we see, well, I mean, so mathematically you can model this as having some sort of network and maybe there's a probabilistic manner in which um, neighboring individuals are infected on successive rounds of a spread. And all you see is a snapshot of who has been infected. Maybe you have some information about um, what the social network is, or maybe you have to estimate that yourself and you want to try to figure out what the initial um, instigator was. Um, well, in statistics, if you've taken some elementary statistics, you'll know that the, there are two problems that are often studied. One is estimating something and one is um, developing confidence intervals. So confidence intervals tell you, I don't just want a point estimator. I don't just want one value. I want an interval of, of estimates that with a certain um, high confidence um, include the actual value that I'm trying to track down. So the stat statistical um, dual of this in, in the context of networks is, you know, I might ask, well, what is the, um, what is the best estimate of the first individual who created the, or who, who started the disease? Um, or what is um, a set, a confidence set, a set so that with some high probability, let's say at least 95%, um, it, it includes the instigator of the disease. Okay, so this is one problem that, that I, I've worked on in my own research. Um, and, and just to kind of drive home the point, you know, as, as a theoretical statistician, you can think about networks, but networks don't just mean one application. It, it doesn't just have to be disease. When I say 
infection and disease, you know, I might be thinking about a COVID network, but you can also apply the same procedures and ask the same questions for problems involving, for instance, epileptic seizures. So if you think about the brain as a, as a connected network of neurons, you might also want to ask, if I know that certain neurons have fired, um, can I try to identify where it, where it came from? Or in sensor networks, you know, you, you, you notice some, some outages at certain sites and you want to know um, where did the outage begin? Okay. Um, and then another question that I also wanted to cover, I think this is the last question that, that I wanted to highlight is, which I worked on um, quite recently with a student, um, is, um, is a question about um, trying to infer the structure of a network from epidemic data. So um, earlier I was talking about inferring the, the structure of a network from a matrix of data where you have lots of measurements um, of lots of different individuals over the same network. Um, but now the question is, you know, maybe you, you know that you have um, these four individuals who were infected during a pandemic um, and you want to try to see what is the most likely social network that, um, that connected them. You know, was it that everyone was friends with everybody else? Was it that there was one person who was friends with everybody, but the others weren't very well connected? Was it a ring and so on? Um, and this has applications to, um, well, I mean, not that I've worked on these as actual applications, but it aspires to applications too, to things like surveillance and cybersecurity. You know, maybe maybe the, the, the disease isn't a disease, but it's information. And you know that information has um, been obtained by these different individuals, and you want to try to infer how are these individuals connected. Um, so um, so there, there are probabilistic models that, um, that we've placed on this. Um, and then what, what we did was we performed some, we, we designed a way to do statistical hypothesis testing, which is hypothesis testing is also something that you, you will encounter in a very basic um, first year statistics class. Um, but, but usually, well, I mean, statistical te hypothesis testing, you have to have some sort of a test statistic, you have to have a rejection rule. And then if, if, you, if, if your test statistic is, is so large, then you reject your hypothesis, otherwise you don't. Um, and so that here we were sort of starting from scratch. You know, this is a type of data that isn't normally studied in statistical problems. So if all you have as your data is that certain individuals are infected, then what would you even use as your test statistic? And how do you come up with a valid hypothesis test that will tell you that it will distinguish between different structures? All right. So what we came up with was um, that the statistic we would use is the edge count between infected individuals. So depending on whether, whether your hypothesis is that um, it's a graph that's completely connected or one that looks a little bit like one individual connected to each person separately or a ring, you count the number of edges um, in the graph that are between um, red nodes. And this starts to distinguish between, um, between the, the possible configurations. Um, and then it's, it, it took a lot of, of work and, and cleverness on our parts, but um, then, then you also need to construct a valid um, method for hypothesis testing. You know, this is just like sort of the first, the first step. And then the second step is, is, is kind of bringing in all of the math, figuring out what's the right model of spread under which you can actually say rigorously that if you perform this test with a particular rejection threshold, then with probability, at least 95%, you'll be correct and so on. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go into the details here. But kind of to, just to summarize um, on these ideas on, on network data, um, what, what um, I and, and, and other researchers who work on these topics um, try to do is we, we look at network data, we try to devise and understand um, new procedures for performing statistical tests and inferences on them. Um, and in particular, in, um, in this last example, infer the graph structure. Okay, so I've, I've talked long enough already, um, and I, I know that I've covered a lot of ground on a lot of very different topics, but um, my take home messages for you um, are to, to know that um, research and statistics, you know, it, it's, it, it, it can be quite interesting because what you can do is you can draw from different tools in mathematics. Um, in my work, I, I mostly draw from calculus or real analysis, um, probability and optimization. Um, and the problems that we study, you know, depending on how theoretical a statistician you are, you can be as abstract as you want. If you don't want to go anywhere near data, that's fine. You can spend all your time just thinking about very abstract things. Um, but there is some underlying motivation for most of the problems you're studying. So you feel like you are at least a little bit more connected to the real world. And I've studied, I, I've discussed some, some motivating applications, mostly in medicine, but also um, engineering and computer science. Um, and the other point is that as, as time has, um, has gone on, there are a lot of more interesting data structures that have emerged um, and the abundance of complex large scale data like MRI data, um, mRNA data, neuronal data, 
um, infection data and so on. Um, all this new data has given us lots of new challenges and opportunities. So there are always very interesting problems to be thinking about as a statistician. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the math open days. Um, thank you. <laughs>